Hello, everybody. Welcome to Round the Horn. The music you hear in the background is from our special guest, Mike Daly of Mike Daly and the Planets. All of my heroes are fading away. And I've seen too many friends reach the end of their day. Mike is a journalist, a singer songwriter, and a huge Mets fan. Hello, Mike. How are you? Doing well, Lee. Well, that's great to hear. I know that um, you've got uh, a busy schedule with your band and uh, some other things that you're doing. So let, let's let's go in and talk a little bit about your background first. Well, let's see. I am, I'm a Jersey boy uh, from uh, uh, Prospect Park, New Jersey, my original hometown. Uh, Uncle Floyd has a joke about Prospect Park. He says it's such a small town that its zip code is 07. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true it's it's a blink and you miss it kind of town that i grew up in a suburb of patterson and uh and i live in hawthorne which is right next door right. um uh, went to all local schools uh i started off uh as a as a, a journalist working for the old patterson news for anybody who remembers the old patterson news which has been defunct now for probably 30 40 years uh, worked in newspapers a lot, uh, got a lot of, uh, 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 put in a lot of time there in both the daily side and the weekly side. And, uh, that's, uh, that's pretty much sums it up for now. Okay. And how about your music background? Music background. I, I started, started playing in bands when I was 14 years old and, uh, I've had, uh, Various cover bands and also uh, two original bands, uh, Every Damn Day, which was uh, my band in the 90s uh, into leading into 2000. And uh, from 2008 up until current day, uh, Mike Daly and the Planets. It's a great name, too. <laughs> Every time I, I, I see, you know, when I'm trying to pick songs out for my radio show, Mike Daly and the Planets always sticks out, you know, and, and you always have the vision of uh, Clark Kent. <laughs> That's what I'm going for. Yeah, and, and of course, you got the glasses the right way. Right, right. <laughs> right. So, and uh, what's going on with the band these days? Oh, you know, quarantining, uh, unfortunately. Uh, we, we put out uh, nothing really going on live, unfortunately, because of COVID, but uh, we put out two things over the summer. Uh, this is my life, which is kind of a reflective uh, song dealing with mortality. I just went through a uh, a second cancer scare in my life, which is fortunately behind me. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Oh, that's great. And uh, then uh, the fall, the new one is called "Fallen Out of Love Song." That's that's been out for a couple of weeks, and uh, we've been getting a good response to it. I'm really happy with it, but I will not be truly happy until uh, everything's cleared up and we can go out and start playing uh, live gigs again. It's been too long. It's amazing. Every weekend I've been doing some uh, MC work for the Asbury Park Music Foundation, but uh, you know, the gigs are few and far between. That's for sure. I haven't worked since, uh, since March actually. Yeah. It's March. We had, we had, we had a game on the that we canceled out of an abundance of caution and never realizing that we wouldn't still have not played any gigs at this point in, in the, on the calendar. Uh, and we, that was going to be our first gig of the year. <laughs> so we haven't played any gigs this year at all. We haven't played a gig since December of uh, 2019. I'm admiring the background behind you, the uh, Rickenbacker and uh, yeah. that Gibson. That's an Epiphone, Epiphone Sheraton 2. Oh, great. Uh, Epiphone acoustic to John Lennon model. That's that, the John Lennon model. That's my wife's ukulele up in the end. Uh, <laughs> Do you usually play the Rickenbacker in, on shows? Well, uh, I have two guitars that I play, and this is my this is my most recent acquisition, by the way. It's a twelve string Rickenbacker, so oh, that, wow. that, okay. that was featured on uh, our recent, our most recent recording. I usually play uh, uh, either Rickenbacker three thirty or I have a Squire Telecaster uh, F line. Uh, those are my two main guitars uh, that I play. That's great. Great, great music that you're putting out lately. Well, okay. let's get into baseball. That's why yeah, we're here. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm excited about it. an avid baseball fan, right? 
<laughs> yes, absolutely. I see the uniform. Yep, that's my Tom Seaver jersey. Oh, is it really? Cool. I ha I, it's a road jersey, too. And I have this thing. It's very funny where uh, if I buy uh, merchandise that has a player's name and number on it, uh, you can pretty much count on them either uh, getting uh, traded or seriously injured. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to uh, – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give myself a pass on Tom Seaver because uh, he, he – unfortunately, we lost him this year. We went very sad. Yeah, but uh, I'm not, not going to blame the jersey on that. Uh, but uh, multiple other times, you know, Ike Davis, Matt Harvey, uh, people of that respect from the Mets. Uh, by the way, I, in case you didn't know, I'm a Mets fan. Oh, absolutely uh, right. Yeah, those are the uh, those are the people. I try. I've been. Uh, I feel like I'm a jinx. You know, it's the same thing. It's like, oh, I didn't watch the game and they lost. You know, that's right, how, right, how right. sports fans are. Yeah. But uh -huh. uh, I have a way of jinxing my uh, uh, jinxing my favorite players on the team by buying their jerseys. So I, I try and limit that. At all possible. Play as a youngster? I did. Uh, I was a year behind everybody in terms of development. Um, got to be a pretty decent contact hitter in Little League and then uh, got up to 90 foot bases, switched from 60 foot bases to 90 foot bases and uh, found out that it just wasn't there. You know, I, I remember go, uh, taking batting practice, trying to make this uh, travel team and hit a ball right on what I thought was right on the nose and it, you know, it made it to the edge of the grass. And the, uh, <laughs> I know that transition was a little tough. I mean, I, playing little league, I, guess this, I was a I lot guess bigger. Than, was I was a lot bigger than most kids for little league. And then when I go into the 90 foot bases, that's the equalizer. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. You know, and I found from the pitcher's mound, it was like, it's almost a mile to the plate. How am I going <laughs> to? <laughs> right. You yeah. know what's amazing to me, uh, you know, as a ball player, and you know, I basically continued on in in my career after uh, playing softball for a few years. But it still amazes me when I watch a ball game on TV that those fields are the same distances as we had played as amateurs. Although it looks like the bases are two miles apart. Mm -hmm. And it just, it just amazes me that we're playing on the same fields as, as everybody else is. Right. Yeah. I had a pretty decent outfield arm uh, and, and the transition to the bigger field wasn't that much for trouble, much trouble for me or outfield right. range or anything like that. But the hitting was just, I didn't, I didn't, wasn't there. There was no power there at all. So were you a Mets fan growing up? I was. As a matter of fact, interestingly, I've written about this before. My uh, my first real experience with baseball uh, was uh, when I was nine years old. I, I used to have uh, used to have chronic tonsillitis, and I missed a week of school due to chronic tonsillitis, and it happened to coincide with the '71 World Series okay. between the Orioles and the Cincinnati Reds. Right. And I watched every game, every second of every game, or listened to it on the radio. Really fell in love with the game, uh, fell in love with uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates, even though both teams had tremendous, I mean, uh, you know, you get Roberto Clemente and Willie Stargell on, on, yes. on the Pirates and uh, Brooks Robinson, Frank Robinson, Boo Powell, uh, you know, and that, that the 420 game winners on the, on the sure, pitching exactly. side. Exactly. Yep. They were heavily, heavily favored to uh, win that World Series, I, I found out later, and my limited knowledge of baseball at the time, but I fell in love with the game and then... Pittsburgh was out of town, so you didn't get it. Back then, there were no out-of-town games on television except for the game, game, game of the week on the weekends. And you weren't going to get to see Pittsburgh more than a couple times in a season if you were lucky. So um, I, I chose my allegiance to the Mets. Uh, Tom Seaver, in particular, was, uh, was the guy who uh, really kind of brought me around to the Mets. My family had been Yankee fans before that, the Mickey Mantle era of the Yankees. But you were right, right. I became a Mets fan in the seventies and I, I actually followed both teams uh, pretty evenly. Uh, but I was, if, I've always said if the Mets played the Yankees in the world series, I'd root for the Mets. So uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've been a fan all my life. You know, a uh, few of the guys that had been on previous to you as guests have had some great experiences that they were relating to. Uh, one in particular, Danny Roselli. I don't know if you know Danny from the Mylars. But Danny worked in a gas station, uh, I guess in high school, that was frequented by Phil Rizzuto. <laughs> and every time that really? he would come in for gas, he would bring baseballs and sign them for the guys. 
So That's it was awesome. kind of an amazing situation. And, and recently I saw on, I don't know, some real estate um, site that the original, I guess the shopping center where Yogi Berra and Phil Rizzuto had their bowling alley was up for right. sale. <laughs> right. Yeah, Berra Rizzuto. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But, you know, in, in my case, um, my love for the Yankees and the Mets were kind of equal. And my grandfather in particular was a giant, giant Mets fan. And um, you know, he listened to the away games, uh, you know, late at night on the radio and uh, uh, never played the, the game itself because he was an immigrant from Poland. But he always attended my baseball games as a, as a high school player. And he just absolutely loved the Mets. And of course, you know, we all think about Tom Seaver and uh, Tom Terrific. Uh, yeah. He was unbelievable. But that was the uh... – I have grudges that I've held with both teams. And <laughs> okay. the first grudge was when M. Donald Grant traded away Tom Seaver and Dave Kingman on the same night. Oh yeah, yeah. The and uh, the uh, the Yankee gripe that I had was when they replaced Tino Martinez with uh, Mark Teixeira. Uh, uh, Mark Teixeira? Yeah. Yeah. Mark. No, Jason Giambi. Jason Giambi. Oh, that's right. It was Giambi. T- right. Tino with G- Jason Giambi. Yeah. I kind of lost lost interest in, in, in them at that time. I, I came back around to the Mets after the Seaver thing. I came back around to the Mets when they were playing guys like Mookie Wilson and Hubie Brooks and young, younger, uh, bringing in some younger guys yeah. uh, who were interesting to watch, even though their records were pretty terrible. They were, they were, they were at least fun to watch. It's so amazing to actually go back and uh, look at the archives and, and see Casey Stengel. And of course, he was a great manager for the Yankees. And then when he came to the Mets, it was like, you know, can anybody play this game? Right. But what was really funny was, and I don't know if you've ever seen it, but he was called to testify in Congress about baseball and its operations. Right. So there's this long diatribe from Casey making no sense whatsoever. And it was like he couldn't answer a question. He, he couldn't tell you if the weather was, was sunny outside in like more than, more than one word. And it was funny because Mickey Mantle was a witness after Casey. So Casey goes through this long, long, hilarious diatribe. And they asked Mantle if he felt, you know, about what he felt about the, the whole situation with uh, the congressional hearings. And he said, well, I kind of agree with what Casey just said. (laughs) You know, if you listen to that whole thing that Casey said, you just, you were amazed that there was any sense made out of it at all. And here's Mantle saying that he agreed with everything that he said. And considering that he was testifying for Congress, he probably made as much sense as anybody else in the room. Absolutely right. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, favorite players these days? Favorite players these days, uh, I, uh, DeGrom, uh, Jake DeGrom I like, and uh, Michael Conforto, uh, those, those are my, uh, uh, those are my two big guys right now. I like those guys. Yeah, there's some uh, great up and coming guys on the Mets, that's for sure. And it's mm-hmm. good that, uh, you know, hopefully with uh, new ownership, there's going to be some more competitive teams put on the field. Right. We'll have to see what happens when, uh, you know, those guys come into office. Although, you know, I respect Sandy Alderson and uh, what he's done in the past for uh, everybody uh, that he's he's been associated with. Right. That's yeah. Sure. I, th- this season has been weird. It's almost like it wasn't a real season then. And hard, hard to come in in the middle, cold like that, and, uh, and have, uh, you know, every game be – you know, ultimately, you are only playing 60 games. Every game is ultimately an important game. Absolutely. And, right. Uh, right. Uh, uh, you know, the guy, you know, we're, we're, uh, uh, this leads me into my, my changes in the game. You know, they're, they're talking about keeping the, keeping the rule where the uh, extra innings opens with a runner on second base. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, I hate the shift. And, and every time I see a guy uh, come up and they've given him the whole left side of the infield, I can't figure out why he won't bunt for a base hit because 
it, 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 you, if, if that became a widespread practice, the shift would be gone. No, nobody would, nobody would employ it. I saw Carlos Delgado of all guys do that but before the shift really came into vogue. Right. Actually had a game with the Mets where Carlos Delgado came up and bunted a ball up the third base line because the guy gave him the hole. Guys gave him the hole. The shortstop was positioned between second base and third base. And uh, he gave him the hole right left side of the infield to, uh, right. to get a Rizzo's base. done that a few times. Yeah. I mean, I, I, every time it happens, I say, bunt. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, and I don't like openers. I'm not a fan of the opener. I, you no. Know, no, no, it's it's no. it's still the same game. You, you, you can get into the analytics all you want, and you know, you, I guess you have to be on even playing field analytics wise. But it's still the same game. And yeah, it's the game we played as a kid, and and you know you, you, you figure out ways to push runs across, and you know you feeding information into a into a commute a computer and following an algorithm is not going to make that you know no. any better. Yeah. You know, I, I, every time I see the shift, I can almost imagine Ted Williams rolling over in his grave, screaming at the guy, hit it the other way! I, yeah, yeah, sure. And that's something they actually practice a whole lot in batting practice. Right. But you don't see it in a game. You know, if they had inter-squad games in spring training, I would, if I, and I were the manager, I would say, you know, any, any time the shift is on, practice bunting. Take it, take it, right? Yeah, exactly. It's base hit. You got to run around base. They're giving you a base hit. Sure, sure. But I don't, players don't know how to bunt anymore. No, and that was one of the things that Rizzuto used to teach at Yankee camp all the time. And he would go down there just to teach bunting. Yeah. Our thanks to Mike Daly of Mike Daly and the Planets for stopping by and spending some time with us. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next week.